hopefully, hopefully you can all see my screen. All right, so this is working with neurodivergent survivors. My name is Morgan Hunter and I use they and them pronouns. So um, just a little bit about me. So I identify as multiply neurodivergent. Um, a couple of different types of neurodiversity that I know that I experience, PTSD, ADHD, autistic, probably some other stuff I don't know about. I'm white, agender, um, I'm a survivor. All those are like parts of like my identity. I'm a social worker. I'm, my, my focus is more on making systems um, change records than um, working individually with, with folks. Um, and I'm really interested in particular in looking at um, pleasures prevention frameworks around like sexual health equity and how that can be used to prevent violence. And I'm currently living on the occupied land at the Cowlitz, the Cascades, the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, Pacamas, and the Confederated Tribes of Silet. My, my family lives on the occupied land of the Shoshone Bannock in the Eastern Shoshone. So I know that I think most of you have already introduced yourselves in the chat. Um, feel free to continue to do that. And um, I believe that, uh, let me look here. I think I have a Jamboard for you here. If you feel more comfortable introducing yourself on the Jamboard, um, you can use that as well. And there's a couple of other pages that we'll be using um, as we um, do some activities together today. All right, so um, to get started, our agenda. So what is neurodiversity? We'll talk about kind of overview of um, an, an understanding of neurodiversity and the neurodiversity paradigm, kind of um, some of the, the folks who might have um, been like, um, instrumental in sort of developing that um, idea. And then we'll talk about um, sort of like some current understandings of why neurodivergent people tend to experience high rates of sexual assaults. And this is based both on some research that still kind of limited in this area as, as well as um, just being in community with a lot of neurodivergent survivors and like over, over the years and talking and like listening to folks like how they've kind of described this sort of thing. And then we'll um, talk about um, some ways of providing trauma-informed care to neurodivergent survivors and um, then hopefully we'll, we might have some time for questions at the end if we have any. All right, so um, first of all, what is neurodiversity? So um, I'm sure that most of you have probably probably heard that term now. I just think it's becoming a bit more mainstream, the term neurodiversity, but um, it can include lots of different types of things. Um, I have on the screen an image of like a, a person's face turned sideways and you can see like the brain inside is sort of stylized. And then there's a rainbow colored um, circle around the person's um, head with different, um, different examples of types of um, neurodiversity, and I'll, I'll read those to you. Um, they include things like dyslexia, dyscalculia, ADHD, autism, dyspraxia, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, epilepsy, intellectual disability, tricks, and tic disorders. And then um, the next slide, there's kind of a similar image that has um, someone's face turned sideways. Um, and then um, kind of around the face, there's some bubbles that have different examples of neurodiversity. A lot of these are the same as the last one, but it also includes things like acquired neurodiversity, which could be um, acquired neurodiversity would just be like anything that you're not born with. So that might be like a traumatic brain injury or um, maybe like the dementia or things like that, that you um, don't have um, at, at first. It also includes mental health, and um, I think the rest of that is the same, but um, th this one is also kind of like interesting because it um, talks about some of the, the, the strengths that tend to go along with different types of um, neurodiversity. For instance, that dyscalculia um, might have um, verbal skills and um, creativity, that dyslexia um, might involve creativity and authenticity in the um, ADHD could um, include authenticity and hyperfocus, that Tourette's um, might have hyperfocus and innovative thinking, acquired neurodiversity might mean innovative thinking and resilience, that uh, mental health could be um, resilience and sensory awareness, that um, autism could be sensory awareness and honesty, um, that dyspraxia could be um, honesty and, and verbal skills. So 
I think that that's just kind of um, helpful to kind of think about that neurodiversity can be like different ways of experiencing things. Um, that's and that it's helpful to kind of move beyond slowly, like just pathologizing things. All right. So I'm um, talking a little bit more about the term neurodiversity. Um, it was coined in 1998 by the sociologist Judy Singer. Um, and on the next page, I'll have a, an image of Ju a Judy Singer uh, that I can give an image description of. The term neurodivergent was coined by um, a different person, the activist Kastiana Asasumasu. I couldn't find the exact date for that, but um, I'm guessing it's probably sometime in the early aughts. Um, variation, um, um, neurodiversity refers to variations um, in brain regarding sociability, learning, attention, and mood, and that it might cause communication differences. Um, and so on the last two slides, we looked at, um, or I think it was a couple slides ago, with the, the, the circles around the, the faces and the different types of neurodiversity. Um, my hope with that is that it's really kind of like conveying that there's really like a, a, a breadth of different sorts of experiences that kind of fall under the umbrella of neurodiversity. And so uh, it's not really possible to say, you know, neurodivergent people are gonna need this or that thing. It's kind of more of like a, a framework for thinking about um, the types of differences that people might be experiencing. It's kind of my, my hope for this. So neurodiversity um, might overlap with things that are sometimes referred to as invisible disabilities or developmental disabilities. And I know not everyone likes the word invisible disability because it kind of implies that the disability doesn't exist or, um, and so, but I'm just letting you know that sometimes that's a, that, that's a term that is re referred to some things that, that, that can also count as a neurodiversity. So. The neurodiversity paradigm promotes understanding, acceptance, and accommodation of these differences. And so um, I think that's the really important thing to remember is um, that neurodiversity, um, it, it means like a different way of thinking about it. It's not just kind of using a, a different word to describe these things that we know about. But it's, it's really kind of like um, a fundamental change in kind of how we how we think about um, differences of, of kind of like mood and, and processing. And so just some, some more on kind of like language and how um, that's used. The term neurodiverse refers to neurodiversity within a group of people. So you wouldn't say that a single person was neurodiverse, but you would say if you have like a group of people and they have different neurotypes, you might say this is a neurodiverse group. And neurotypical refers to someone who's not neurodivergent. All right, um, then this slide, I have an image of Judy Singer on the left and an image of Kastiana Asasumasu on the right. Judy Singer um, is an older adult with light skin and glasses and light colored um, hair that's kind of cut in a bob, um, wearing like a, a dark shirt. They're uh, looking out into like a window with some light flying across their face. And then um, Kassiana um, is a um, younger adult with um, dark brown hair, medium skin, and um, flowers in their hair with um, a tree behind them. All right. And um, the so one thing I want to stress um, is that neurodiversity and the term neurodivergent, this is it's not referring to a diagnosis. If people are not diagnosed as being neurodivergent, they might get diagnoses for something else and then choose to identify as neurodivergent if they want. Um, but also it's important to remember that not everyone has access to a diagnosis. And so um, the neurodiversity paradigm is really, um, it expands kind of like beyond just like, like med medical model like labels for these different diagnoses because Lots of folks will never have access to that, or it might not be safe for them to openly identify with the diagnosis. So um, that's another kind of like way in which the neurodiversity paradigm is sort of like different than kind of um, the, some of the, the medical language that's used around diagnoses. But so then one of the things that I want to stress when we're thinking about this on a systems level is that you know like with each you know, individual that I can work with, you might not know kind of like how they identify and it's not necessarily like a good, good thing to like I guess people because that can be kind of um can be a little bit in invasive but um the, the the my hope for this is that um 
on an organizational and systems level that implementing um, kind of some of the ideas from the neurodiversity paradigm that that can help neurodivergent people, whether or not they're actually openly kind of identified as neurodivergent. The neurodiversity paradigm means looking at how systems of oppression affect neurodivergent people. So um, some examples of this could include um, thinking about how normal is being defined um, in the organization. For instance, in particular, whose perspective is being valued, whose perspective is not valued. Uh, neurodiversity paradigm means thinking about inclusion and accommodation rather than seclusion and exclusion. It means thinking about supported decision making rather than guardianships or conservatorships. And um, with survivors, uh, of course, as probably most of you know, that um, with disabled and neurodivergent survivors, that um, issues around guardians having a lot of control over a person, that can be a, a big aspect of kind of um, dynamics of power and control. And so the neurodiversity paradigm, I think, is kind of like really encouraging us to kind of like think about, um, I think, recognizing kind of like what some of those dynamics might be, rather than sort of normalizing these dynamics of power and control. Um, and the neurodiversity paradigm, it also means not basing a person's worth on their productivity. Um, a lot of um, notions about productivity are really rooted in ableism. And so uh, I think that can kind of help to be like a, a reminder that, you know, different people have different paces at which they work and um, that a lot of notions of productivity like really are not going to like work for everyone. So. Um, and then it, I also, I think I also included some slides that we'll get to a little bit later that are talking about thinking in, in terms of like productivity, like why the neurodiversity paradigm when we're thinking about um, creating spaces that are accessible for neurodivergent survivors, why that's also important to think about um, accessibility for staff as well, since that can ultimately impact the survivors. Um, I have on the screen now like a, a quote by Nick Walker um, about the neurodiversity paradigm. Um, that I want to read because I think it's really helpful and illustrative. Um, the neurodiversity paradigm is an emergent paradigm in which neurodiversity is understood to be a form of human diversity that is subject to the same social dynamics as, the, as other forms of diversity, including dynamics of power and oppression. And of course, um, intersectionality is always important, and so the other identities that a person experiences, along with being neurodivergent, or very much going to, in, to impact kind of how they experience the world and how they're treated. Um, BIPOC neurodivergent people have a very different experience than white neurodivergent people. So um, I, um, on this slide, I have some articles that um, you can check out if you want to read more about um, understanding and defining neurodiversity. These are also in um, the materials that were sent out ahead of time and that um, you can access afterward the, the, the links. Um, all right, so um, let's do a Jamboard activity. So, um, and let's see, I will repaste that in the chat in case any of you came in afterward and don't have access to the Jamboard, you have access to it now. So um, Jamboard activity. And um, if Jamboard is not accessible for you, um, you can feel free to just type in the chat or to unmute and speak instead. So you have three ways of participating, but the Jamboard is there if that works for you. Um, so the, the prompt for this um, is, can you identify one area of your work where you could implement a neurodiversity affirming approach. What changes would you make? And um, the second um, follow-up question is, is there an area of your work where you would like to have more of a neurodiversity affirming approach? Would you like to discuss ideas for how to make that happen? So just based on kind of what we've gone over as far as um, like what neurodiversity is and what the neurodiversity paradigm is, um, can you, like, on the top of your head, just as you're thinking right now, are there any places in your work where it seems like that would be helpful? Right.
And I'm going to hop over to the Jam board. Uh, some folks are introducing themselves in the Jam board. Oh, um, for this prompt, um, we're on page number two, not page number one. Um, I think I saw someone posting something on, on page number one. That, that's okay, but yeah, um, there should be a, a separate page for this one. Looks like we have one response already. I'm not assuming that everyone has the same learning style. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Hopefully it's easier to see. Go. Having information available in a variety of formats and kinds of languages, yeah, would be great. Stimulating tools, toys, and or non-stimulating environments to assist with overstimulation. That sounds great. Giving more time and space. Working with evidence-based curriculum often leads to stigmatizing lessons bound by fidelity. Yeah, um, I remember when I was a, an MSW student, um, I guess it's now been like over a year since I graduated. Um, a thing that I kind of like heard, like discussed a lot is how um, it can be helpful to kind of like look for what's called like practice-based evidence instead that sometimes like evidence-based practices um, Sometimes the evidence that it's based off of is not really applicable to some of the communities that it's applied to. And so um, it could be helpful to kind of think about the other way around in, in terms of um, like what, what are communities actually saying that's um, helpful for them and, and relevant. Adjusting training materials to be more accessible, including neurodivergent voices and the creation of those. It's very important, thank you. And again, if, if Jamboard is not accessible for you, feel free to use the chat or feel free to unmute and speak if that works better. Some of the trainings are heavy in textual material. I feel like having a variety of mediums within training would be better equipped. Yeah, that makes sense. Hiring more neurodiverse people, yes. Facilitating. Facilitating conversations, topics for educators and teachers, having questions on intakes for staff and clients about access needs around neurodiversity. Yes, um, that's really important too. Um, and I think another thing that we're going to talk about is also um, thinking about um, since not everyone might not know kind of like what their access needs are if they're not aware that they're neurodivergent, but kind of like thinking at what sorts of changes can be made up front. To try to make this, this space more accessible for everyone and more of like a universal design sort of um, practice. I think policies and practices audited by neurodiverse expert community members. That sounds really important. It's also um, when when we are like asking community members to do like work like that, for that it's also like really important to make sure that they are being compensated. So sometimes um, I think particularly with a lot of um, um, folks with disabilities and disabled folks, that there is sometimes an expectation to um, not that they shouldn't get paid for that. So make as much as possible, making sure that that um, isn't happening is, is really important. Right. Creating quiet and calming spaces for everyone to access if they are feeling overstimulated and normalizing their use making sure accommodation policies are inclusive for both staff and services, having yes, multiple ways to take in information during presentations, training, visual auditory, tactile, et cetera. Those are all great. And then on page three, my organization, which is, um, page three is a response to the, 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 the second prompt, which was, is there an area of your work where you'd like to see more of a neurodiversity approach? affirming approach and if you'd like to discuss ideas for how to make that happen. Um, someone wrote, my organization provides housing assistance to survivors of DV. Some of our el eligibility requirements is that they have a job, which is a barrier for a lot of folks with disabilities. Yeah, that um, that is a major barrier. Um, and I think um, 
if there, yeah, if there are ways of um, making like a, a amendments to that um, policy, I think that would be really, really helpful for neurodivergent survivors. Um, I, yeah, I, I know that um, one of the communities that I'm a part of, the autistic community, tends to have really, really low employment rates. And so that's one of the reasons why autistic people tend to um, end up in a lot of abusive relationships is that it's, it's difficult to get out when you um, don't have a job. Let's see. Let's see if we have any... Any new ideas? I don't think I'm seeing any new ones. All right. Oh, we have a couple more. Um, understanding and affirming that there is more than one acceptable communication style. Yeah, um, that that is um, oftentimes really, I think, challenging in professional environments where there's this sort of expectation that um, professional communication has to look one way and that it's usually um, very kind of like aligned with, um, I think very aligned with like whiteness as well, usually in a certain um, like class expectation, but um, definitely is gonna be something that will impact neurodivergent people. And so, yeah, I think being aware of that, really kind of thinking about um, like how to respond, like if someone is maybe not communicating in the way that is like, you know, dominating society might be expecting to kind of try to be more inclusive and more accepting of that um, and, and celebrating of, of, of difference. How trauma manifests differently for neurodivergent folks, but does trauma look like for different people? Yeah, and um, it can really look like a lot of different things, I think, but um, I think, I think it can just be helpful to be aware of the fact that, um, that some of the barriers that neurodivergent folks do experience to getting help can be um, not appearing to be like a typical survivor in terms of like de describing things um, in their experience, maybe not, not appearing like upset, people expect them to be upset or um, maybe like having difficulty recalling things in a way that people might, might not expect, but um, I think um, we'll see if we have kind of like time to talk about that specifically. Um, some of that is, is very kind of like, is it obviously is gonna kind of like depend on like the, on the population, but um, I know that oftentimes there's a tendency for, um, I think particularly, I think with a lot of like folks with like intellectual disability and, and autistic people, that um, manifestations of trauma are oftentimes seen as just someone having kind of like quote difficult behaviors and so um, that oftentimes that gets missed and so I think that's maybe just something to kind of like be, be aware of that that does happen um, that like if, if someone is kind of singing like um, like they're having like a hard time that it could be um, that, that like, there would be like trauma there and, and realizing that the systems around them might be kind of labeling them as, as just being difficult. I would like some clarification when talking about someone, for example, my child or myself who have multiple challenges on the neurodivergent fell shown earlier. Is that still referred to as neurodivergent or could it be neurodiverse because it's more than one challenge? Oh, um, yeah, so that, that would still be called neurodivergent. Um, I think um, that the, the term neurodiverse, I think generally just does like refer to kind of like, um, it's like diversity within a group of people, but um, you can, I mean, lot, lots of us are like multiply neurodivergent in like more than one way. Um, but I hope that that's helpful. There's often a lot of very long, very detailed paperwork involving, involved depending on what path the survivor wants to take. Can we, how can we make that process more affirming and accessible? Yeah, I think um, as much as possible, trying to get rid of paperwork that doesn't need to be there or finding other ways of getting that information filled out. Um, 
that that could be really helpful. I know when I was doing a project a couple of years ago, that was actually a piece of advice that someone told me as far as um, how to um, try to make spaces more trauma informed for just disabled folks generally is like trying to like reduce the amount of paperwork that people have to fill out since that is a known barrier. Um, the wheel do detect challenges. Yes. Um, so the images and like that that we went over earlier with the um, the talking about kind of like different types of like neurodiverse experiences that will all, that's all in the slide. So um, can um, access that afterwards. An organization or population can be diverse when individuals part of that diversity. Right. Um, it's kind of like a minor thing, but. Um, it's, I think it's, it is kind of like helpful to kind of think about that um, neurodiversity um, or, or when we say kind of like neurodiverse that it's, that there is kind of like a, a, a useful way of kind of thinking about having like a actual kind of like diversity within the kind of group, so, all right. All right, well, let's move on. So why do neurodivergent people experience high rates of abuse? And um, feel free to keep adding stuff into the, the, the jam boards. Um, those are yours to keep like afterwards to kind of like go back over kind of the things that we talked dis discussed today. Um, so, um, so some factors that contribute to violence that neurodivergent people experience. And as I mentioned before, um, there is some research on this. Um, so, some of this is based on that, and some of those um, citations will be in the um, at the end of the slides here. But um, one of the problems with the research is that a lot of it is not really broken down even by specific disability. It's not even broken down by kind of the how we would categorize neurodiversity. It's oftentimes um, just using really kind of like general categories around disability or maybe developmental disability. Um, and so it can be kind of hard to actually understand which populations are being like just discussed, things are kind of get lumped together. Um, and so um, this is kind of like a combination of like what we do have as far as like research and also as I mentioned before, my own experience being in community with a lot of neurodivergent folks, including a lot of people who are survivors. So um, some of the factors that contribute to violence are of course like the past and the present of eugenics ideology. Um, you have a lot of time to go into eugenics ideology. I have some of some workshops I do that I go into that a bit more. But um, um, eugenics, if you don't know, is sort of the um, was a, a term that was um, really popular in the um, early twentieth century. And the idea, um, like, it means kind of like good genes. Like, literally, that's what the, uh, the word means. But um, is that like some people should be having more children. Um, that some people shouldn't have children and some and that the, the government should be involved in kind of like um you know preventing certain people from from having children and um some of the the targeted groups that were you know considered to that that, that shouldn't have children included of course um people with disabilities just disabled folks um, um black indigenous people of color um sex workers um people who were involved in the um, criminal justice system um and a lot, a lot of other, um, a lot of other populations, and so um, that we, we don't use the word eugenics today very much. Um, but these ideas about, you know, kind of like who's like, like whose sexuality is more more valuable than others, and who should be having sex, still really kind of like impacts kind of like how you know their neurodivergent people experience, you know, their sexuality being treated. And that includes oftentimes a lack of access to sexual health education in schools, um, particularly if someone has an IEP or that they're might be getting um, any kind of like special like services for, like regarding like disability, that um, they might be inclined to more likely to be like not not given kind of like the general sex education curriculum that their their peers might be getting. Um, and, and so that just is um, not, not giving people kind of like the information to be able to even like make informed decisions about sexuality or to like understand um, um, reproductive choices. Um, and then of course, um, like almost like no one gets like information around like things like consent and pleasure. And those are, those are also very important. Um, um, one of the things that comes along with disability and neurodiversity um, is 
expectations to be compliant and to not assert boundaries or needs. Um, sometimes this might be just sort of subtly taught to this idea that um, the people around you, that neurotypical people know better, that their perception of reality is the correct one, and that the neurodivergence person's perception of reality is, is wrong in some way. Um, in my own community, I mentioned that I'm autistic. In my own community of autistic people, um, it's pretty common to kind of like hear people talk about how they might have been told their whole life, you know, like, like gaslighting, that um, that if they complained about it's too it's too light in this room, it's too like it's too bright, it's too loud. Um, I'm having these sensory issues from these things that maybe other people aren't bothered by. That they might have been told, oh no, it's okay. You just need to habituate to this because. Um, it might not be bothering other people. And so um, that's just one example that I've heard a lot in the autistic community, but, um, and there, there can also be times where maybe if a person is receiving a lot of disability related support that um, they might have been taught, you know, explicitly to be compliant. And that while, you know, like, well, like the intention is generally not to actually cause harm to this person, we do know that that does, you know, can 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 be very harmful, and um, that it can make it really hard for folks to be able to assert boundaries when they're not given the opportunity to practice how to do that, or like you know, when that's not something that they're allowed to do. All right. So some other factors that contribute to this violence are ableism that blames the survivor for their abuse, um, and kind of like naturalizes abuse as normal. And um, I say this in part because um, I'm, I am really interested in, in research on this topic. And one of the things that I see in a lot of research articles um, is that um, oftentimes it's as framed as that because someone has disability, because someone is neurodivergent, that um, that, that, is, that that just automatically kind of like, that the disability is the cause of the violence as though um, there's no social context around that. Um, and it's kind of almost this sort of like victim blaming language that the person is kind of like the, the cause of it and of course that that means that oftentimes the focus is not on what are the social factors that are kind of really enabling this violence to happen and so these are all things that survivors experience that um, might be perpetuating the harm um, and as part of the autistic community something that i've heard a lot of autistic people say um, is that um, they tend to be um, taken advantage of a lot because of the tendency to be trusting and so um, I, have, I have some specifics with that community just because it's one that I'm part of, so I hear more from that. But um, so there's lots of, um, my, my hope with this is to kind of look at this from a, a broader kind of more systemic level to kind of understand that um, survivors um, who are neurodivergent are um, tending to experience some certain types of, kind of systemic forms of oppression that are contributing towards violence and being aware of that is really important. Um, we know that this abuse occurs at high rates from childhood through adulthood, um, and we know that this abuse comes from caretakers and family members, and not just relationship partners. And so, um, maybe some of the, the traditional like narratives around like, domestic violence might not really fit um, if the abuse is coming from lots of different directions. Um, and specifically because uh, if, if this person is if, if, if the abuse somehow relates to the support that they might be needing from people, that it might be hard to identify that person as, you know, as, as, as causing harm to them if they're also being a, in a support role, because generally people who are supporting someone who has a disability or is neurodivergent are kind of seen as, you know, in a, in a positive light. And so sometimes it's hard to recognize that actually harm might be happening as well as, as support. Historically, little attention has been given to neurodivergent survivors. I think this really intersects a lot with the um, eugenics that I mentioned earlier, that there's kind of been a lot of, um, I mean, eugenics itself is a form of violence. And so I think that there's been a lot of um, kind of normalization of that. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, like research is still minimal. And so, um, and the people are oftentimes grouped into general categories, um, which makes it kind of hard to understand maybe some of the specific experiences of, of different groups of folks. Um, and so having more research on, on this will hopefully help us to understand this a little bit better. Um, 
you know, divergent people are oftentimes stereotyped as a perpetrator. One of the things that I find really interesting is despite the fact that there um, is not a lot of really good research on um, survivors um, or how to support survivors, very, very little research on how to support survivors um, um, with disabilities or who are neurodivergent. There's a lot of research around um, perpetrators who uh, are neurodivergent. And um, I, I think that it kind of maybe it shifts the, the focus away from kind of like addressing kind of like the high rates of the violence that people are experiencing, unfortunately. Um, and then there's also the, the normalization of compliance training. Um, so some people might be experiencing this specifically to a form of therapy. Um, in the autistic community, there's been a lot of criticism of applied behavior analysis for contributing to this. Um, but uh, people don't necessarily have to experience a certain type of therapy to experience compliance training. Sometimes that's just like schools might expect that people kind of um, have kind of like compliance kind of like goals for someone or um, that might just come up in kind of like family settings or even kind of um, partner and intimate partner like um, interactions. Neurodivergent survivors might not be seen as credible when they're reporting. Um, and this could be because maybe they don't communicate in the way that, you know, authorities are expecting them to maybe um, maybe they have a lot of like pauses in their speech or maybe their speech um, seems atypical in other ways. Um, and, and we know um, that that if someone's kind of like not presenting um, with what's kind of like the like dominant society is kind of seems as like normative speech that oftentimes they're not seen as that they're not kind of like seen as really as, as being as credible. And so a lot of kind of like biases can, can go into that. Um, um, BIPOC neurodivergent survivors in particular might be especially likely to be unfairly labeled as the perpetrator. And so it's really important to think about um, how like intersectionality is showing up here. And that this might make it easier for abusers to hide their actions and um, like for BIPOC neurodivergence folks, um, stimming might cause others to see them as dangerous. Stimming kind of just like refers to sort of like self-signatory kind of like actions, like maybe like hand flapping or um, other things like that. But um, if someone, for people who are already like very, very experiencing a lot of like marginalization and oppression, but um, um, engaging in kind of like non-socially normative behaviors like stimming sometimes might um, cause violence towards them because of um, because of like the intersection of um, ableism and racism. Um, and by neurodivergent survivors are more likely to experience police violence, including when they're asking for help. And so it's like further additional barriers to getting help and um, being more likely to experience harm instead. We know that there are high rates of violence across genders. Um, um, and that there's one study I read that found that there were more similarities than differences in um, between um, experiences of cis men and cis women um, with developmental disabilities. And that's really important because um, I think it just thinking about that with neurodivergent folks that um, it's not just women, it's not just femmes who are experiencing violence that um, that there are like really kind of like higher rates kind of like, like across genders. Um, um, in my own community, there's been a lot of like attention to the fact that a lot of autistic people are gender diverse. So really thinking about, um, you know, like beyond kind of like gender binaries and thinking about like how like that might be creating additional barriers to survivors who maybe don't fit into standard understandings of gender, maybe that expectations around gender and who is a perpetrator or not a perpetrator might be contributing to barriers that people are experiencing. Um, I mentioned that I myself identify as a gender person and a survivor. Um, and that this all creates barriers for receiving support for people who are, are not cisgender women. All right, so let's do another Jamboard activity. So what are some ways in which being aware of the factors that contribute toward violence against neurodivergent people can be helpful when working with neurodivergent survivors. 
and the second prompt. In your own work, have you noticed that neurodivergent survivors experience certain barriers to receiving support? If so, what sort of barriers? And this is like, if you want to kind of um, maybe workshop this together as a group a little bit and think about kind of how to, like, are, are there certain, are there specific barriers that you, that you notice coming up a lot? And um, maybe we can think about some things that we could try to do to address those barriers. I think some of you have kind of identified some of them already, but this is another opportunity. And then I'm gonna repaste the Jamboard in case anyone didn't get it earlier. And again, there should be, um, if you just click the um, arrow at the top, right, there should be additional pages for, um, for these activities as well. And again, if the Jamboard is not accessible to you, you're welcome to use the chat instead or to unmute and speak. So you have three different options for participating. All right, I'm on page four. So what are some ways in which being aware of the factors that contribute toward violence against our divergent folks and can be helpful? Um, better able to identify and check ableism in oneself and others. Yes, oh, I think, there we go. Yeah, I think sometimes the, the sticky notes kind of land on top of each other so that they move them around. Um, being more aware of being means being able to provide more services and or support based on that knowledge and you can connect more with the person. Thank you, yes. Um, my, my hope here is um, that going over some of these, um, like first we talked about kind of like what neurodiversity is and the neurodiversity paradigm and then kind of like the factors we know that contribute toward violence that, um, with all these things, like I don't think they're like really kind of going to be like easy answers. Particularly that this is like a really neurodiversity is a really big and broad umbrella. A lot of different types of experiences that fall under that. My hope is that this can provide like some tools and kind of a framework for thinking about um, for thinking about these issues. And of course, yeah, as as you're all kind of identifying that um, because when neurodivergent people are experiencing violence, usually ableism is in some way a component of that violence that um, really being aware of, you know, if, if ableism is showing up in organizations and really kind of thinking about how is ableism impacting this person and trying to reduce that can be really helpful and it's really important. And of course, not just ableism, but thinking about like how racism or how like homophobia and transphobia because of course people have many identities at once. I can prevent ableism and advocacy as a field and in specific interaction to survivors. Yes. And I think um, that's going to be particularly important interacting with survivors who maybe, I mean, you know, might not be used to kind of like having options or, you know, being able to like make their own decisions if they've been controlled by people a lot of their lives. And so I think that really just kind of like underscores why um, that is so important. Better able to connect with clients on a personal and emotional level. You know, it gives you baseline information so the survivor doesn't have to do as much labor to explain the full context of their situation to you. Yeah. And that's really like my hope for like why I'm talking about these patterns of violence. Of course, um, you know, everyone's experience is gonna be different. Um, but I think one of the important parts of trauma-informed care is understanding just that trauma is very prevalent. And so with that, I think when thinking about neurodivergent survivors, I think part of that means understanding some of the, the patterns and the violence that this population is likely to have experienced. We can include relevant curriculum about dynamics of abuse in our support groups. Yeah, um, I've seen some the modified do lift wheels that um, I think kind of like address some of this, there's like a, a medical pipe power and control bill. And then I think also one that I think like is, it's, it's like the, the same content, but I think it was like about like um, therapists that um, I think some of that is kind of like relevant to it and thinking about um, sort of like the, the normalization of, 
um, violence against kind of folks who are having, having a, maybe having a lot of like interaction with like the medical systems that so then that can definitely include a lot of neurodivergent people. So. All right, on to page five. In your own work, have you noticed that neurodivergent survivors experience certain barriers to receiving support? If so, what sort of barriers? Hard for clients to trust institutions and professionals after facing institutional abuse in the past. Absolutely, yes. Um, institutions are so oftentimes a cause of that violence. And then speaking from personal experience there. Um, Ableist doubts of competency leads to doubts regarding reports of abuse. Exactly. Yes. And so I think, I think that that comment, I think really is getting at something that um, I think efforts to really kind of like support like neurodivergent survivors really means I think like elevating perspectives of neurodivergent survivors. Um, something I, a resource that I want to share with you all of you in a little bit, um, I think I have it on, in the slides, but, um, and it was in the slide, the, in the information that was sent out ahead of time too, if you access that. But um, I attended a conference recently that um, had a, some information about this peer support group, I think it's mostly um, involves folks with intellectual disability, but, um, and not um, neurodivergent folks um, in general, but um, I think it's, it's a really kind of like beautiful like peer support model for like um, folks with disabilities supporting other folks with, with disabilities who are survivors. And so um, I think, yeah, that like really kind of like centering um, specifically kind of like experiences of neurodivergent survivors would be so important. I have seen cops and others getting exasperated with neurodivergent survivors because of things like not making eye contact, um, being less verbal, or not following through on tasks. Yeah, that um, that all tracks. Um, and um, yeah, then those those are all kind of like um, ways in which people might not be getting the help that they need. Um, and. I think I heard someone on mute. Go ahead and speak if you'd like to. All right. Um, some folks, some folks have learned to mask their neurodivergent traits to survive. Indeed. So might not present this way. They can prevent, and that this can prevent knowing what support they need. Yeah. Um, masking is such a, a huge issue. And um, like we have something in the chat. Can we have a link to the peer support you're talking about, please? Yes, um, I'm going to post it um, a little bit later on. Um, I promise. Um, it's in, I have it in the slides. I just um, the one of the the, the sticky notes just kind of like reminded me of that. So but yes, I will get to that. Um, but yeah, um, the, the comment about massing is so so important, and I don't think that can be understated. Um, and I think that goes in like understanding like the pressures under which people mask and the fact that people can experience like a range of kind of um, like need for kind of like support in their life and then still be able to kind of like present a certain way in limited settings is so essential for being able to understand kind of the dynamics of power and control that neurodivergent people experience. Um, I, um, um, I kind of, I started getting involved in doing this work by like, organizing a support group for survivors in the local BDSM scene in Portland. And there were so many neurodivergent survivors there. And um, yeah, I think that, that the whole issue with um, masking is just, it really comes up a lot. And that there's a lot of like neurodivergent people have a lot of um, a lot of self doubt around masking because there's this sort of like assumption of um, that you're you're a fraud if you mask that you're not um, you're not real, and then there's this issue of like maybe you're not really you're not really disabled you don't really need need support if you um, can mask and, and appear to not not be neuro neurodivergent in other settings and so I think um, just being aware of that is so important. We also see this in our intervention program. People, um, intervention program, 
people and, and have learned that they need a slightly different approach with their homework explanations, et cetera. Different approaches are key. Yes. And so, yeah, I think um, really recognizing that people can have all, all different like need, need, needs around um, learn, learning and support is so important. All right. I don't think I'm seeing any other sticky notes coming up. As always, feel free to keep adding sticky notes. Um, and then if you would like to unmute and speak instead of the Jamboard is not accessible for you, please feel free to go ahead. We'll wait just a little bit more before moving on. All right, so um, the last topic that we're gonna be talking about is how can we provide trauma-informed care to neurodivergent survivors? So we've been talking a lot about thinking about these sort of like big systemic issues, like understanding kind of like neurodiversity is the neurodiversity paradigm, how ableism is impacting people particularly thinking about intersectionality with ableism and other forms of oppression and thinking about how like lots of the, the sorts of like systemic factors that contribute towards the violence that people experience on a systemic and kind of like personal level. So now we're gonna like move into thinking about um, like trying to respond to, to this and um, trying to think about like what are some of the most important things to keep in mind when providing trauma and foreign care. All right, so um, an image on the screen that is taken from Trauma-Informed Oregon's website. I interned with them um, about a little, little over a year ago um, as part of my MSW education. So um, I'm going to read off um, this to you. It's the Guiding Principles of Trauma-Informed Care, and there are six of them. Um, Safety throughout the organization, staff and the people they serve feel physically and psychologically safe. Trustworthiness and transparency. Organizational operations and decisions are conducted with transparency and the goal of building and maintaining trust among staff, clients and family members and those receiving services. Peer support and mutual self-help. These are integral to the organizational and service delivery approach and are understood as a key vehicle for building trust, establishing safety and empowerment, collaboration and mutuality. There is a recognition that healing happens in relationships and in the meaningful sharing of power and decision-making. The organization recognizes that everyone has a role to play in a trauma-informed approach and does not have to be a therapist to be therapeutic. Empowerment, voice and choice. Organization aims to strengthen the staff, client, and family members' experience of choice and recognizes that every person's experience is unique and requires an individualized approach. This builds on what clients, staff, and communities have to offer rather than responding to perceived deficits. And I think that is especially important in thinking about neurodivergent survivors because, I mean, if you look at the, the DSM, like, you know, definition of most of the um, types of neurodiversity that I um, showed you in kind of like those, those first slides, it is all very, very deficit focused. Um, and that's why I think that the slide that I, I showed that kind of um, identified some of the, the strengths that sometimes come with experiences of neurodiversity that that's important. Um, it's not that people don't struggle, but I think just realizing that that's not the whole story. And so um, I think that this, um, the, the principle around empowerment, voice, and choice is really getting at a lot of that and like why that's important. And then lastly, cultural, historical, and gender issues. The organization actively moves past cultural stereotypes and biases, offers culturally responsive services, leverages the healing value of traditional cultural connections, and recognizes and addresses historical trauma. And with um, that last um, point, I think it's also important to like kind of like re remember that um, different communities might have different understandings of 
um, what I'm referring to is neurodiversity. And so like, for instance, um, like the medical, like, like neurodiversity is like exists as kind of a response to um, sort of like the like Western medical model, but um, like in, in indigenous communities have had like their own understandings of um, these things that, you know, we, we, we label, you know, with various medical terms that, you know, might be like much, much older kind of under understandings of that. And so I think that's important to keep that in mind that um, this is not the only way of understanding it. And so being um, trauma-informed means kind of like being responsive to how different communities are understanding, like what I'm referring to as neurodiversity and might have like different, um, different terms for it or different concepts around that. All right. Um, and with that, I'm also going to be talking about, before I move on, um, that is important to center um, BIPOC neurodivergent survivors. Um, and I say this just because um, there is so much of the work that is done around disability generally is very, very white, including like for neuro neurodivergent folks. And um, it is a huge problem. And so I think that when we're talking about like neurodiversity, it is really important that we think about how this is impacting people like intersectionally because like we're not making progress if we're not doing that. Um, and trauma-informed care requires us to acknowledge the impact of historical and ongoing violence towards like multiply marginalized populations because of that. Um, and disability justice specifically requires us to center the margins. Um, another part like why, of like what's like relevant to that is that we know that racial bias influences diagnoses, um, specifically um, in determining who tends to get access to supports and who tends to get pathologized and punished and segregated. And so um, that means that when we're thinking about um, supporting neurodivergent survivors that I mentioned earlier that you know, the experiences of like a bi BIPOC like neurodivergent person is very, very different from the experiences of white neurodivergent people. And, um, you know, this really, like, this shows up in the medical system a lot in terms of like how people get access to supports, of course. Um, and so that's all, and that's really important to think about. Um, and then I, I mentioned um, earlier, kind of, um, you know, like the, the colonized land that like my my own family like lives on and that I lived on but like it's, it's important to kind of think about um how all of these things are still impacting survivors and you know that you know neurodivergent survivors exist in every community all right and I also think it's really important to center neurodivergent sex workers I mentioned that um eugenics that, that you know, eugenics, like the, the violence of eugenics could also apply to sex workers. But, um, and so with that, I think it's important to think about um, how that's particularly impacting neurodivergent sex workers. And um, in, in part that is because um, many neurodivergent people are sex workers because of the lack of accessibility of traditional jobs that sometimes um, that is like a way of making a living that is more accessible and that works for people. Um, but of course, the stigma around sex work creates barriers to, barriers to getting support um, when this all happens, um, particularly with people who might have like additional like, um, like um, marginalized identities. And so um, I think that when we're thinking about supporting neurodivergent survivors that, you know, we, we don't just, it's important that we don't just center like the, the, the straight heterosexual um, and it's just, it's just this this gender um, woman in a monogamous relationship, but that we're really thinking about that neurodivergent survivors includes all neurodivergent survivors, um, and this is especially true for neuro neurodivergent people, also like trans and like BIPOC, and thinking about how like are we you know are we being like inclusive of of, of these people as well, and and, and that it's really important to um, listen to neurodivergent sex workers and center their needs and perspectives. Um, you can do some. I think um, there's there's lots of like articles that have been written about like neurodivergent sex workers on their kind of perspectives on stuff, and think that that is a really helpful resource to read about. Um, so, why is it important to understand the intersection of trauma and neurodiversity? So. Um, it's probably, I kind of killed here at this point, like why that's important, but um, 
couple things to say. So um, it's important for understanding the relationship between trauma and neurodiversity um, and how the two are connected and how to accurately recognize signs of trauma in people who are neurodivergent. I mentioned earlier that um, that oftentimes um, for folks who have like a, um, I think what I found the, the two kind of like diagnoses that I've seen specifically mentioned were um, intellectual disability and um, autism, um, that there was a tendency for folks who maybe like, who were not really familiar with um, those experiences of neurodiversity to um, not recognize, you know, signs of trauma and, you know, trauma, just PTSD, that's also a form of neurodiversity, but it's, you know, separate. Um, that's something that, you know, comes afterward, you're not born with that. Um, and so just becoming more aware of like what neurodiversity is, is really important for understanding that. Um, and that, that's gonna be important for, you know, as many of you said, like, you know, like building trust with neurodivergent survivors, um, understanding kind of like the patterns of people's experiences. And um, a big part of this also means that there's like needs for addressing barriers to receiving mental health support because um, if people are not able to get mental health support to address that trauma then that is is, an, is another, another factor for like why the trauma symptoms might be just kind of like you know described as oh it's just because they're because they're autistic because of another disability that they have um that they're just not, not recognizing that it, this is a trauma symptom um that something actually had happened and so some of that, like it really just means, um, I think, believing people and not, um, I think, just dismissing kind of like when people are kind of like displaying, you know, what oftentimes gets, you know, just attributed as like problem behaviors, that recognizing that sometimes like when someone is having a lot of, experiencing a lot of kind of like big behaviors or, you know, it might be that there might be some trauma happening there. Um, so what parts of disability culture should providers know in order to provide trauma-informed care? And this really touches on a lot of um, cultural, historical, and gender issues. So we talked about the neurodiversity paradigm. The neurodiversity paradigm is, you know, like, you know, that's a big part of um, neurodiversity culture and um, like intersects with disability culture. Um, uh, some people prefer identity first language um, along with that, I think I mentioned, um, with the word autistic, you don't say person with autism generally. Um, it's important, of course, to ask each person what language they prefer because that's important for empowerment, voice, and choice. But um, with that understanding, like which communities tend to prefer person first language, which communities tend to prefer identity first language. Um, the intellectual disability community tends to prefer person first language, but the autistic community tends to prefer identity first language. Um, I mentioned, um, so in my own community, the autistic community, the puzzle piece is oftentimes considered to be very offensive. Um, so I, I highly recommend not, not using that if, if you're um, including kind of like symbols that are referencing um, neurodiversity. Um, there's a rainbow infinity loop that um, that, that is a symbol for uh, neurodiversity pride that um, is generally more accepted instead. And it looks like a, an infinity symbol with like a rainbow gradient kind of like running from um, from one side to the other. Um, some other um, things that you can do, and this is like part of kind of like thinking about, um, oh, what's offensive about the puzzle piece? Yes, so um, the puzzle piece has a long and sordid history, um, but, um, but basically kind of like the, the history of it has been and the, the way that it's been used as, as a symbol for autistic people is this idea that something is missing or that um, there's something kind of like inherently wrong with someone um, or that there's this puzzle that like that neurotypical people don't understand what's wrong with them. Um, and so on the one hand, it's, it's both, it's um, kind of at, at face value, it's sort of this, it's, it's, it's a language and it's a narrative that's written by like, outsiders looking at autistic people and trying to kind of just describe them. It's not a way that autistic people are describing themselves as being like, I am a puzzle. They're not saying that. Um, it's other people saying you are a puzzle or something is missing about you. Um, and 
it, there's also there's that there's so there, there's that and then there's, I think there's also some kind of like feeling that the puzzle piece is a little bit infantilizing as like a it's in like looking like a, a toy that children play with because um neurodivergent people in general tend to be kind of seen as children and so there's some sensitivity around that um so yeah i hope that that kind of is as helpful um i think in general when we're thinking about um language or symbols or like ideas that are ableist i think one of like the really kind of like important things to think about is like who came up with this like you know it was this created by you know the the disability or the neurodivergent the neurodivergent community that it's describing or was it created by somebody else about them and that if you can figure that out that's usually kind of like a, a good way of kind of understanding like um which ideas or concepts or you know like what which like where words might be seen as offensive and which ones might be seen as more um affirming so um along with that um avoiding functional level language can be really important um Oh, I like that point too, because most of the symbols used are easy to piece together where they're used where they came from. Yes. Um, so functional level language um, is things like saying, oh, you know, so-and-so is high functioning or low functioning. Um, it, yeah, it, um, there's kind of like, I think a general kind of like feeling in like a lot of like disability spaces, but that's um, stigmatizing and that it's, um, it both kind of, um, it, it minimizes like the, the strengths of people who get labeled as low functioning, um, it kind of dehumanizes. And then it also like denies like the support needs of people who get labeled as high function. Um, because the, the reality is, is that things are messy and, and complicated and that um, people might need different amounts of support in different areas of their life at different times in their life. And that just labeling someone is kind of like High functioning or low functioning is it is really does it both a disservice to kind of like their needs and also um, is considered offensive. Um, I think I mentioned stimming earlier. Um, a lot of neurodivergent folks stim. I think it's kind of associated a lot specifically with like ADHD and autistic folks. Um, but I mean, you know, humans in general tend to stim. Um, Stimming can be lots of different types of movement. They might be like it might be vocalizations. Maybe it's like repeating like a word a lot. Um, some people might stim more when they're upset, and so it could be a way of self-soothing. And so um, it, that means it's like it can be important to like recognize that um, like if someone is is like stimming and that like maybe like engaging in behaviors that seem maybe a little bit atypical that like that doesn't mean that they're dangerous, um, that they, this might just be someone who's trying to self-regulate and calm themselves down, that they might just be upset. And so recognizing um, like what's actually going on, maybe understanding like, is there something in the environment that's upsetting them? Um, and trying to figure out how can we like support this person without trying to like escalate the situation. Um, Oftentimes, police are called when when this happens, and that just contributes to violence and harm. Um, often, because oftentimes, like this is not like someone who's in, in any means violent. And so, um, I think that's just important to kind of like keep in mind that um, that sometimes, like particularly for like a like a, like a, a BIPOC a neurodivergent person is um, is engaging in like stimming because like they're they're distressed. That um, really thinking about like how do we kind of like understand like what's happening how do we support this person and like not like have more harm happen to them so um another thing that i think is really important we've all been talking about you know how multiple forms of communication are so important that people communicate and learn in very different ways um and so this means you know like being supportive of people's need for sign language having you know sign language interpreters using letter boards uh, a letter board is is like um where you have like a they're oftentimes like a, like a, a laminated kind of like board where you like you point to letters and, and spell that way um text to speech devices um and recognizing that you know people might communicate in many many different ways and um not expecting people to to use speech and maybe even like they they can use speech but maybe a different method is actually better for them. 
and I say celebrating all the forms of communication because um, I think part of kind of addressing like this the stigma and the harm that people experience is really kind of um, celebrating like the, this like this difference in diversity is a positive thing. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some types of accessibility and issues that might be important. Um, of course, it's hard to I mean without actually being physically kind of like in the space. Um, it's hard to kind of like say kind of like these are all the issues in this space and these are all the issues in this space but kind of them gen generally here are some kind of, kind of like broad broad picture issues that tend to come up um, a lot so consider all aspects of sensory experience um, so think about all, all the different senses that we have as humans so like are there like bright lights like fluorescent lighting in particular can be a lot of can, can be an issue for some folks um, um, smells can be an issue, like, like having like scent free environments can be really helpful for people. Um, like our, like what, what sorts of environmental noise like are, are going on like, um, and sometimes some people might have like really hypersensitive hearing so they might actually hear things that you don't but um, just be, being aware of that. Um, and also being aware that like when someone is, you know, experiencing trauma activation, they might be even more sensitive to like stuff that's disturbing them. Um, one of the things that we talk about sometimes in like this and disability culture is spoon theory. Um, this sort of idea that um, like you start you start your day off with a certain number of spoons and then when you do certain tasks you lose those spoons and then once you're out you can't really do a whole lot more. Um, but like dealing with um, traumatic and stressful events you know, is going to take a lot of spoons and then being in this place that's maybe not accessible to you that's stressful and you know irritating in various ways is also going to take spoons and that when we're thinking about someone's capacity to um, communicate clearly that all of that's going to like, impact that and so as much as possible trying to make the environment um, more accessible is going to make is going to make all that better for people um, bright colors might be like also like might be difficult for some folks um, so having predictability and clear guidelines can be really, really helpful. And this is, you know, ties directly to the um, trauma-informed care principle of trustworthiness and transparency. Um, and another thing to think about um, is like, are there multiple ways that someone could reach out without for support? For instance, like, is there are there both like, you know, options options to call and text if um, what one or the other like, doesn't work for someone. Um, it can be helpful to consider the use of visual examples. Um, I think some of you have mentioned that like there's a lot of tends to be a lot of like reading. Um, it's like having more like alternatives for people who might be more like, visual learners or like maybe like that maybe like reading is not the, the primary way that they learn. That that's going to be really helpful um, as far as kind of like letting people know kind of like what to expect and like as far as like conveying information to people. Um, having name tags can be really helpful because um learning names can be hard <laughs> and um name, 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 name text can just make everything a lot, lot easier um, some, some people um have what's called um face blindness or um prosopagnosia where it's hard to distinguish faces um and so having name text can be really helpful um, it can be helpful to give time to process information um, and that don't do don't give too much information at once and I realize this as I'm giving a presentation where there's a lot of information but um, I hope that with the slides that you can review that but um, so um, a lot of neurodivergent people might have um, differences around information processing and so that um, can mean that there might be a feeling of overwhelm if they're given too much information at once and so um, thinking about in like the any materials that you might be giving people or in the way that information is presented, like are there ways to try to break stuff down a little bit more so that maybe there's more time to process or that it's kind of in like more digestible chunks and anything around that could be helpful for someone who has like a processing issue around kind of um, processing lots of information at a time. Um, it's also helpful to think about are there quiet spaces where someone can go if they need a quiet space um and i realize that maybe you, you don't have that in your you know in the space that that you're at but um that i mean as, as much as possible and um, like some, some of the, these things might not be possible but um as much as they are like that could be helpful for 
folks. Um, and then are there spaces for people to move about and, and stem or self-regulate um, if they need to? And this directly ties in with the um, trauma-informed care principle safety. I mentioned earlier that sometimes um, people don't always react well to people stimming and that kind of thing and self-regulating through stimming. And so um, like having like a safe place for people to, to stim can be really helpful. Um, is written information in plain language? Um, plain language, um, I don't have time to kind of go into like all of what that is today, but um, there's lots of resources online about what plain language is. Um, that's gonna be helpful for lots of people, including um, just making making written materials more accessible in general. Um, you know, basically plain language kind of like means um, using shorter sentences, using kind of like clearer language, not, not using a lot of kind of um, big kind of convoluted ac academic words as much as possible, um, being kind of like clearer and more to the point that stuff is easier to understand. Um, is information available in multiple formats? Again, um, people have all different access needs. And so they can go, some people are gonna process best through writing, some people will process best through watching videos or looking at pictures, um, there's, or maybe kind of like through, through hearing um, the audio recordings. Um, there's no kind of like one single way that will work best for everyone. But um, I think part of accessibility means like having kind of things available in multiple formats. And again, I mean, like this isn't just, the, these are not things that benefit just neurodivergent people, but, but um, having more accessibility benefits everyone. All right, so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit specifically about what, what a neurodiversity friendly environment can look like. And this ties in a lot with cultural, historical and gender issues. So um, this means attention to time and space. So I think we've talked a bit about, I think, yeah, I think someone kind of like mentioned something about this in one of the sticky note and activities earlier, but um, attention to time and space really means that things might take longer. Um, and that and this might mean kind of like thinking about, well, if, if there's requirements for like how much time someone is allowed to have to, you know, to think about something, um, what, like, what's the flexibility within the organization to maybe give people more time if they need it? Because that, that might just be like an, a, an accessibility issue that some people need. I know myself as a multiply neurodivergent person, um, I need a lot of time to like process information that, and I think it's not always apparent to people that I need that because I'm highly educated and I don't appear um, disabled, I think in a, lot, in a lot of spaces, but, um, and so, so I, I say that people might need more, more time and space, you know, with, with the knowledge that you can't always tell who's gonna need that and who won't, but, um, and then also really think about how the environment impacts the individual. I talked a lot about kind of thinking about the, the space earlier, but um, it means really thinking that, um, that kind of like what you kind of like are, are seeing in the in, in, in individual as far as kind of um, the way that they're able to present or like the, the, the degree of, ex of distress that they're experiencing, like the, all of that is gonna be impacted by the environment that they're in and so, um, as much as possible trying to make that environment um, easier and more soothing, more accessible, less stressful, more predictable, all of that is gonna be helpful. Um, and recognize that neurodivergent people might express emotion differently than, than you expect them to. And so um, that also might be taking longer with them to understand like what they are feeling. And it might mean, um, making sure that they are able to communicate in like their preferred method of communication to be able to express like what they are feeling. Um, and that also means recognizing that neurodivergent people are valuable and celebrating that difference, not just tolerating it, but celebrating it. And that means hiring staff who identify as neurodivergent. Uh, it's especially great if they identify as neurodivergent openly, but of course not everyone does that. But like having, um, ha there is like a, there's a, there's a, there is like a value to having neurodivergent people as staff, but there's also an additional value to having people who openly identify them that as far as like representation, because you know, rep representation does um, impact folks. Neurodivergent people do sometimes communicate best with other neurodivergent people. Um, the studies that I've seen around this, I think, were really 
thinking specifically to autistic people, but um, just as far as thinking about um, having staff that can understand, because like again, like um, neurodiversity, disability, these are all like you know cultural experiences themselves, and so having people who have similar cultural backgrounds is going to make that easier for them to relate to and understand and like work with um, neurodivergent survivors or having that um, baseline of kind of like cultural understanding. And of course, um, hiring and supporting neurodivergent staff means um, providing support to them in order to prevent, prevent um, like burnout and, and to promote workforce wellness. Um, it's, it's not just enough to just hire the staff, but they do need to like, be supported and um, that that's really important. So um, then we're talking about peer support on this slide. So I'm going to bring up um, my speaker notes as promised. So that is the um, peer support resource that I mentioned earlier. It's called Start by Believing. Um, I think this is um, exists in Massachusetts. Um, there's a, like a, a video in one that's like 17 minutes long, so I'm not going to play it here because it's a bit too long to play in a, in a workshop. And then also I've got a link to some other like information about it. But um, it sounded really great and from kind of what I understood in the the um, the conference that I attended, where it was it was discussed. It, it sounded like it was. Um, survivors, um, I think with intellectual disability, I think they have plans to kind of expand it, but those were the, the folks that they had them currently, um, who were providing peer support to other survivors around like their experiences. Um, and it sounds really amazing and like very kind of like working in like, um, like sort of like doing kind of like the survivor centered kind of like liberatory work that I think is gonna be really important. So I'd really love to see something like that occur here in Oregon if y'all are able to make that happen. Um, and I think that re-examining um, ableist biases about neurodivergent people, I've brought that up so many times, but um, I, I think that that cannot be like, overstated, but um, that means developing an awareness of biases and actively working to reduce their impact on neurodivergent people, um, whether or not they have a diagnosis. And so a, a, a big part of like this workshop today is just talking about like what these biases are because um, I think that so much of the work of supporting neurodivergent survivors is just kind of unpacking that ableism and trying to re reduce like the the barrier that the ableism is causing as they're trying to get support. That's probably like the, the biggest thing that we can do is really addressing that. All right, so. Um, I want to talk a little bit about addressing workplace norms and practices, as I talked about, about earlier about how um, part of supporting neurodivergent survivors is recognizing you know, that um, it's important to have neurodivergent staff. So, um, so with that, um, consider the end goal. For, for, for example, the end goal could be increasing the quality of service to neurodivergent survivors. Um, so in thinking about that and in thinking about providing support to neurodivergent staff, what aspects of a person's job are essential and not flexible? Um, and which parts of their job can be flexible? And so um, this might mean kind of, like kind of thinking about like what are kind of the, the assumptions around like what this job needs to be in order to serve neurodiver neurodivergent survivors. And then what parts, what parts of it can be flexible? Um, and so I think that means kind of like, like when people are working or not working, um, but um, and again, that's going to depend on the agency as far as like what sorts of resources are available. But um, I think that generally, like in terms of supporting neurodivergent staff, flexibility will be very, very important. And that um, having like a neurodiversity friendly environment is going to show up in terms of how survivors, neurodivergent survivors are treated. Um, so it's very important. Another aspect of that is thinking about how is professionalism defined? Um, is professionalism, you know, is, is the kind of understanding of professionalism, is it reinforcing oppressive norms? Um, is it helping or hurting the quality of service to, to um, diverse survivors? And so um, those are some, I hope that these are some like kind of helpful, maybe like they'll 
that Jack led to kind of thinking, thinking about in terms of um, supporting um, neurodivergent staff. All right, so let's do another Jamboard activity. Um, what is something that your work is doing well in providing trauma-informed care to neurodivergent survivors? And in what areas would you like to see change or growth to better provide trauma-informed care to neurodivergent survivors? Again, um, if the Jamboard is not an accessible format for you, you're welcome to unmute and speak instead or to type in the chat. Mm. Nice. So um, in there, in response to what is something that your work is doing well in preventing trauma and from care to neurodivergent survivors, adjustable lighting in most spaces. That is nice. So you like all the, the lights have like a, the, the dimmer things so you can kind of like change like how bright they are or not. So that, that, that's, that's really nice. Yeah. Proactively engaging with clients about learning styles and communicating our openness to accessibility accommodations. That's great. Another thing that you can do around kind of um, accessibility accommodations that I'm not sure if I've talked about yet um, is having um, information kind of available up front as far as um, like accessibility information, like letting people know kind of like this is what's available. Um, so that maybe people aren't having to like ask for stuff as much, but kind of having more of that, um, so that maybe people know kind of like what to expect and like, then you can do that with like, if you know that there's maybe like something that's not, not very accessible, like letting people kind of like know ahead of time so they don't, so that they don't get there and are get surprised by something. Uh, signs in the lobby to let people know assistive devices are available. Great. That is helpful. Using font size 14 and emails and other documents. That's great. Yes. Providing stinging tools during meeting circles, participants and staff. All our staff meetings feature coloring books, for example. Oh, fun. Yes. Asking an intake if accommodation is needed. Great. Being flexible about how long a certain task, such as paperwork, can take. These are some really great um, examples of um, I think ways that all of your organizations are showing up for neurodivergent survivors. So, yeah, thanks. My hope with this is also that um, kind of like seeing ex examples of this, that maybe if you haven't already talked about these among your, amongst yourselves, this could be helpful to get ideas for other things that can be done. Is neurodivergent have a symbol to show we are neurodivergent? accepting. Yes. Um, so um, I think on some of the earlier slides I did, I had this on the screen. I'm going to go back and see if I can find it. I described, I gave like a visual description of it earlier, but um, let's see. It's toward the beginning. There we go. So um, the top of the screen, this is the, the um, image 
the, the, the slide, the, the image of um, Judy Singer and Kastiana Asasu Masu. But in the, on the top of the screen, in, kind of in between them, there is what's called the neurodiversity pride symbol. And um, it looks like, um, like a, an infinity loop with a rainbow gradient. And I also realized, I think I didn't press enter when I pasted the, um, the links for the um, peer support group. So that's the that's that right there that I posted in the chat. There's both a, a video and then also like a, a website that um, a peer support network. So yes, um, the, the neurodiversity pride symbol is the rainbow infinity symbol. So now I will scroll back through. All right. And I will go back to the gem board. All right, we have lots of ideas here. No questions asked Lux time policy. This is for staff, I presume, as far as you know, having flex time. That's great. That's going to be really helpful for um, like supporting neurodivergent staff. Practically engaging with clients about learning styles and communicating their openness to accessibility accommodations. That is really great. Yeah, look at slide number seven or the page number seven. Um, in what areas would you like to see change or growth in how trauma informed care is provided? Fluorescent lighting is hard. It is hard. Yeah. Um, I know um, in the past, um, I used to facilitate an, an art workshop for autistic adults with um, the Autism Society of Oregon. And we actually had some folks like request like no fluorescent lighting at all. And so we um, found other ways of getting around that, that, you know, like having like the workshop be in a room where we could have like enough natural light coming in through the windows that we um, didn't have to rely on the fluorescent lighting since we couldn't find like a room that, um, that didn't have fluorescent lights. And so, yeah, thinking of like, ways around like that, like if, if, if incandescent like light bulbs or other like alternatives like aren't, aren't available, um, like what are some other kind of like workarounds for that? More trainings working with specific neurodivergences. Yes, I think that um, like this, this training has been really kind of like broad and kind of thinking about neurodiversity like generally, but yes, I think like talking about specific populations is gonna be really important. Specific to my building overhead announcements and the doorbell can be startling. I think we did we lose the, the sticky note about fluorescent lighting. Focus um, placed on auditory environments. So um, you would like the focus to be placed on auditory environments. And I just want to making sure that I understand the sticky note. Ah, improving auditory environments. Ah, yes, yes, that makes sense. Yeah, so like thinking about um, like like sometimes like waiting rooms could be like loud or stressful, or um, and that could be hard for folks. And so yeah, I think um, like if if it's possible to have like a quiet place for folks who need that, because I know that um, in in healthcare settings, there's a lot of um, do a lot of kind of like awareness around that like wait, like waiting rooms in healthcare settings can be really stressful and, and noisy for people and so you know like thinking about like um so is, is there like a quiet space for people to kind of like wait if they're like if they're waiting for an appointment or something and yeah um the comment about um overhead announcements and the doorbell um 
I don't know how, how open your work would be to changing those sorts of things, but that seems like something that would be potentially um, sort of a not too challenging of a fix as far as just changing like a different doorbell or having like a different announcement. Um, but maybe that would be more challenging to change. But um, one of the things that um, can be helpful when you're thinking about trying to make changes on the like, Big level like this because it can feel overwhelming. It's kind of thinking about like, like what are some of like the um, changes that we can make that are going to be um, easy to do that might have like the biggest impact. And so thinking about yeah, like is there something like 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 a, like a, like a doorbell that is just like loud and maybe startling to people? Can we just change that doorbell? And then that's just like one thing that can make like, a big impact on people. Um, sometimes like. Sometimes that can make a helpful way for kind of thinking about like what are like the next steps and trying to implement all of this because yeah I realize that um, it's a it's a big process it's maybe an ongoing process and so um, it can be helpful to kind of figure out like where are some kind of like places to start. All right, um, not seeing any more. Um, sticky notes coming up. Thank you all for participating. All right, so I have um, the last 20 minutes reserved for questions here. Um, do you have anything else that you want to discuss? We can do that as well. I kind of, I wasn't sure exactly how much time we would, we would end up spending on our Jamboard, so I kind of budgeted in some extra time for that, but um, yeah, we have the last I guess, 18 minutes here for questions. I can also kind of like go over and show you. Um, I have a lot of resources here um, at the end that you're welcome to look up and read. Um, I'll kind of give some like visual descriptions of what some of these are. Again, like all of these are in the, the um, materials that will be sent out afterward. Um, there's the Aspire Healthcare Toolkit, um, resources for like, um, like primary care providers. Um, I realize that that's a different environment than like domestic and sexual violence support, but you might find some of that to be helpful as far as kind of like making an environment accessible to people. Um, there's an article about like how it was called like how my autism made me vulnerable to sexual assault, um, Mighty. Um, there's an autism society and um, resource on autism information for domestic violence and sexual assault counselors. Um, an article on sexual knowledge and victimization in those adults with autism spectrum disorders. Um, an article, why are so many people with disabilities abused from end of use of people with disabilities. Um, there is an article we need to talk about the domestic abuse of autistic adults from medium. There's um, supporting transgender autistic youth and adults, a guide for professionals and families. Um, there's um, a study, uh, yeah, the Vulnerability Experiences Quotient Study of Vulnerability, Mental Health, and Life Satisfaction in Autistic Adults. Um, then um, Prevalence of Interpersonal Violence Against Community Living Adults with Disabilities, a Literature Review. I had a comment in the chat. Um, a bit more about the two individuals' um, stories and their, their work. I don't actually know that much about them personally. I know that um, Kasiana Asastamasu is very, um, like, they, like, they're like, very, like, kind of, like, well-known. Like, um, I don't, like, I think I've, I've met them, like, they, they do live in Portland, but um, I don't really know them personally, but um, they've been, like, active and, like, doing a lot of, like, like advocacy, specifically, like, in the autistic community. Um, for a very long time, like one of like, like one of like the longer standing um, like advocates, um, they have I think like a um, Facebook page called um, Radical Neurodivergent Speaking. If you want to look them up, um, I know a little bit less about um, Julie Singer. Um, yes, I'm surprised I don't I don't like see a lot of stuff about about them, but um, yeah. Um, I encourage you to, to read more about them. Like I, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know if I can provide a lot more about that, but. Um, 
if it's helpful, I can keep reading off the names of some of these um, articles if that's helpful. But um, Meeting the Needs of Autistic Survivors, that was a um, Mayor Institute of Justice presentation from a couple of years ago. Um, sexual Abuse and ASD, What Caregivers Should Know, Autistic Boundaries, Squirting and Sexual Assault. Um, reading Contempt, the History of Poor Sterilization in the United States, like kind of thinking about how eugenics plays into all of this. Um, autism and the, the Double Empathy Problem, Implications for Development and Mental Health. Uh, National Disability Authority, the seven principles. This is about talking about um, universal design from the article on that. Um, responding to survivors with autism spectrum disorders, an overview of sexual assault advocates. Um, the role of violent of gender and violence experienced by adults with developmental disabilities. The value of crip time, discarding notions of productivity and guilt and listening to rhythms of our bodies. Um, having all of your internal resources exhausted beyond measure and being left with no cleanup, cleanup crew, defining autistic burnout, to talk a little bit about kind of like burnout and messing earlier. Um, the relationships of autistic and neurotypical women this kind of goes in, it does kind of like address some of the, the issues of like violence that I've mentioned. Um, the 10 principles of disability justice. How abuse mars the lives of autistic people, the neurodiversity paradigm. All right. Uh, any other questions? Oh, um, my own story and expertise. Yeah, so I mentioned that I came to this um, through my own experience of, I mean, I am a survivor as kind of how I got started in this. Like I was previously um, actually trying to train to be a historian in um, from modern Japanese history, sort of a good focus on gender stuff. So um, yeah, so, um, my own experience of being a survivor, I think, and as an autistic person, autistic people are oftentimes good at recognizing patterns. Um, I think um, I really realized that there are a lot of a lot of systemic patterns around um, the the system that kind of caused me to experience violence, and that that was you know unique to me, and um, that this was happening on a really big scale. Um, and so that, that really kind of inspired me to kind of like start doing a lot of the work that I've been doing. And I mentioned that one of the earlier things that I had been engaged in was um, a support group for survivors in the local media scene here in Portland. And of course, like I found that there were a lot of um, neurodivergent survivors and there are a lot of people who were just kind of discovering that they were neurodivergent and that was realizing kind of the connections to that and like um, patterns of abuse they had experienced. And so, um, yeah, this is something I kind of, I guess, had a lot of like interest in because of that. But um, yeah, so I, uh, I, I do a lot of like workshops like this and kind of like on other topics relating to like disability and sexuality generally. Um, and um, I think that a, a, big, a big piece of this, as I mentioned earlier, is sort of the fact that a lot of uh, disabled folks don't get access to sex education and the taboos around disability and sex really contributes to a lot of barriers that people are experiencing and trying to get help because there's kind of like a, a discomfort with um, addressing addressing the violence and kind of acknowledging that this stuff is happening. And I mentioned that I kind of really got started with this and thinking about um, supporting survivors who are in the BDSM community. And there's a lot of kind of, I mean, I'm thinking about kind of like the, the double kind of um, taboo and stigma around disabled survivors who are engaging in BDSM and maybe experiencing abuse and contacts um, and then recognizing how to support them and recognizing that, you know, that doesn't mean that that BDSM is wrong, but like that, that people are still experiencing abuse in these environments and like what does that mean to try to create accessibility and to acknowledge that people also have a right to pursue their sexualities and have sexual fulfillment and that, that doesn't mean that they should be experiencing abuse. So, um, that's kind of been, I guess, my background, if that makes sense. I'm also really, really interested in research. Um, I'm working with an organization right now called Foundations for Divergent Minds that um, on, on creating, um, like we're sending like a survey and we're, we're looking at um, trying to identify like red flags for abuse for like autistic um, people who are um, 
survivors of um, abuse, foundations for divergent minds is all led by autistic people. Um, so like, I would say that like, that is kind of like the community that I'm like most familiar with as far as um, kind of like, like patterns of violence. Um, let's see, so yeah, um, I'm on the board of um, Autism Society of Oregon, do a lot of other stuff. So yeah, I hope that, that I hope that's helpful. Let me know if anyone has any, any other questions. Hi, Morgan. Here, I'll turn my camera on so you can see me. Hi. Um, thank you for the great presentation. Um, I really enjoyed all of it and learned a lot. Um, I wrote the sticky note about um, I work for um, Bradley Engel and we provide housing assistance uh, to survivors of domestic violence. And um, I, I don't know that this is necessarily a question that you can ask, um, but for certain requirements for um, like long-term housing. Um, par part of the re eligibility requirements is that they do, or not for long-term housing, I guess more so for short-term housing, um, but part of the eligibility requirements are um, that they have an income. Um, and I, I've come into contact with, you know, um, so many survivors that have a lot of barriers in place to getting jobs and maintaining them and um, just receiving like any services. And I've just so many times like have talked to survivors that have been um, like really have experienced a lot of harm from institutions um, and have been turned away a lot of times. Um, so I don't even know really what my question is. I guess um, I'm curious if you have anything to say in terms of like anything to say or like resources in terms of like jobs and housing and all that jazz. Yeah, I mean, those, those are those are like the, the big issues. Um, and yeah, like I don't, I don't know if I have any like answers to that. Like I know that um, those are like major, major priority areas for kind of like like the disability community in general, as far as like like you know people needing access to kind of like like essentials, like having an income to survive and like having safe housing. Um, and yeah, like I mean, like just like for, for me personally, like not having that that very much impacted my own experience as a survivor is like those those sorts of issues um and so yeah like um i think that i mean i guess like that i think some of that means like looking at like if the system is set up so that people have to have jobs to be able to get housing then it is going to be leaving some people out and that is that it's going to be meaning that it's going to be much harder for some people to get out of abusive situations when there are not services. Um, and yeah, I guess like I just have hope that there will be more kind of like resources for that. I know that um, I think I've seen in some communities that there's kind of like these efforts to kind of like create um, like more like a affordable kind of like housing like opportunities for like um, people who have disabilities specifically. But I mean, I don't I don't know specifically about the types of barriers that they would have to like proving that they are disabled enough to deserve that sort of housing in the first place because that might be a huge thing. Of, um, getting a disability diagnosis is not cheap, so um, that that can all be really challenging. So um, yeah, I mean. I think that the whole issue of like people need safe housing is just it's huge and um like the reality is like a lot of people who end up living on the streets also experience disability and that, that disability is a big part of kind of like you know not getting not not getting the support and services that they need there um that ending up kind of like being unhoused and that it's just kind of like part of it as part of like the violence towards disabled folks unfortunately so yeah, I, I wish that there were more resources. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, 
appreciate your perspective and of course yeah i don't a lot of what i'm asking is something that needs like systematic change which requires you know it's not like a simple solution um and i've i've worked with so many survivors where it's like sure are like they get um social security um but it's all of that money goes towards their medications which are too expensive and um there are some resources for folks with disabilities in portland but never enough and um it, it's just yeah i guess it's like really frustrating for me being an advocate and seeing not only folks that uh, already had a disability in contacting our organization or have developed one from living on the streets. And yes, so it uh, it's just frustrating, but I appreciate all that you are doing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, th thank you for your work as well. Um, but yeah, regarding that, the thing with like SSI, um, like, I mean, like there are like some like very, very limited number, I think of kind of like controlled like rent, like in housing kind of like options for people, but um, there's never gonna, there, there's not enough for everyone. And like most, like I think generally in this country, like it's very hard for people who are, are on SSI to be able to afford rent. And generally like that means having to have roommates and then you can't really get out of like a dangerous situation if you can't afford to actually like leave and get another apartment. And so um, I think there's this sort of like larger issue of like the, you know, I mean, kind of like at a broader kind of like federal like policy level. It's like, are disabled people valued if like there's, I mean, and, and granted, like getting access to SSI is kind of like winning the lottery. People like try and try for years and years to get access to that. And then it's, you know, gives them a very small amount of money and like requires them to, um, yeah, I'm like, you can't, um, like, you, I mean, like, you, you can't like, you hardly have like any savings at all. So it requires people to kind of like live in like deep poverty to even like maintain like those benefits. And um, yeah, like that, just kind of appreciate, I mean, it just kind of contributes to the violence and it, or it is like a form of violence itself. So um, I think that just kind of naming that maybe is helpful, but um, yeah. Yeah, you're welcome, Julie. Yeah, um, the current income limits are blatantly unjust, but the inability for those on SSI to maintain savings is, is a horrible injustice. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, I just kind of like it, it's, it, it is really awful. And like, I think particularly thinking about that, you know, as, as you probably all know, like one of like the, the biggest reasons why people in general, like you know, why they can't leave abusive situations is like financial issues and lack of safe housing. And like, like I, thinking about kind of how that's really gonna be like really impactful for people who like, that like their only income is SSI and they will lose that SSI if they even try to like work more. They, that then that will be, you know, lost, like their health insurance could be lost through that too. Um, and then not being able to have savings. Yeah, it's, um, it is kind of like a recipe for, you know, for experiencing a lot of violence, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that like, in a lot of ways, like, you know, violence prevention means getting people safe housing. I mean, you know, on like a really big broad system level, it means, you know, policy change to give people safe housing. All right. Well, thank you so much for um, sharing this with me. I think um, Lee will send out the, the slides afterwards so that you can like go over all of this. And then um, on the, the Jamboard, um, you should be able to, um, see that yourself there's like some like three little dots over here on the upper right hand side and if you click on that there should be an option to download and say this as a pdf so that you can keep um, a copy of that for yourself if you want one thank you so much morgan for coming and speaking to us today and we hope to have you again for another training 
Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. I hope that uh, I know it's a lot of information to process. So I hope that um, the going over the slides gives some time to kind of think about that. Thanks for coming today, everybody. And I hope you, you stay cool out there and, and have a good afternoon.